taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see oh praise the Lord Praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He has done. Praise the Lord. Let me invite our kids to come down this morning. You're the first one. Wow. All right, so did you guys get to see the eclipse this week? Yeah? Did you did you stay out of school to see it and go someplace where it was maybe in? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, something is going to happen, I think, to some of you this week. How many are, of you are taking star tests this week? Yeah, some of you. Is it tomorrow? Okay, you better go to bed early tonight, okay? So what is, is it uh, math, science, reading? Okay, okay. Well, can I give you a little test this morning, get you ready? Well, this is probably not going to be on your star test, but this is a math problem. Now, Jackson already knows the answer to this problem, so Jackson, don't give it away. Okay. Yeah, just hold on. Okay. <laughs> don't give it away. I know it's ready to pop right out, but don't do it. Okay, here's the question. Here's the question. What is half of 2 plus 2? What is half of 2 plus 2? Okay, now come on. Now, some of you are, are, you know, you're above second grade, right? <laughs> now, don't give it away, Jackson. Okay, <laughs> don't give it away. What is half of two plus two? No, it's not two. You give up? Okay, Jackson, what is it? Three. Three. Huh? huh? Okay, you, like the teacher's always going to say, now show your work, right? Okay, what is half of two? What is half of two? One, One plus two. Three. Three. You got it? It's not going to be, no, it's not going to be on the star test, so don't worry. But, you know, we, we all get, have tests, don't we? And, and maybe, have you ever been in class and the teacher calls on you, Grayson? Okay, and, the, and Grayson, the teacher asks you a question 
and you have no idea what it is. Does that ever happen to you? Or, or maybe the teacher asked you a question and you were daydreaming and you didn't even hear the question. Maybe, maybe you're thinking about something neat I'm going to do after school or something I'm going to do this weekend. So, but you don't even answer the question. You don't even know what the question was. Maybe, maybe the teacher says, Grayson, who was the first president of the United States? And you really didn't know what the question was because you really weren't listening. And you say, Ben Franklin. Well, that's not right, right? It's not. So we weren't listening. And you know adults, that happens to adults too. Adults can be at work and uh, maybe they're trying to do some work, and, but then they start daydreaming. They're thinking about you, of course, and, uh, or something they've got to do, and they miss something. Well, that happens. But you know when your teacher calls on you at school, he or she is, is trying to make sure that you've learned the lesson that you've been taught. And they're going to try to help you because they're going to give a test so they're asking you these questions so that they can help you get ready for the test, right? Well, do you know that God gives us a test sometimes? God gives us a test too. And it's really important for us to get ready for that test. And maybe it's a test that uh, maybe asking you to do something for someone, to, to help someone, to be a friend to someone that really needs a friend. So how do we prepare for God's test? Well, there's a couple ways. One thing is we read the Bible. You know, the Bible is full of good things in, in there that teach us how to live and how to make good choices and decisions. The other thing is just coming to church, coming to church as we worship together, as we learn together. That helps us prepare for God's test. And then it helps to just practice what God tells us to do. You know, there are things like the Ten Commandments. If we could follow the Ten Commandments, as we practice those things, it helps us when we are being tested. You know, it's, it's really fun to know that God wants us to, to work for him, to, to witness for him. And so he gives us a test. Maybe this week God's going to put somebody in your life that you need to help with something. So maybe just to be a friend. Maybe to help share something that you have with them that will it'll brighten their day. There's a scripture. It comes from... Um, comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Listen to what it says. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. God may give you a test this week. I hope you'll pass it. I hope you'll pass it by doing what God tells you to do by treating others kindly. You know, the more we treat others kindly, the more friends we have. And so I know God's got a special way to, to help you this week pass that test. And I hope you will read the Bible, come to church, and practice what he says. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for your love for us. Help us to study and know your word in the Bible. Help us pay attention to the people around us and to be ready to help them if they, if they need help. Give us the chance to be kind and help us to know how to tell other people about Jesus' love for them. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe is slain. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And God is son, not sparing, 
with us, he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus. Yeah. what comes from our hearts, Lord, is praise of your name, giving you the adoration, the glory that you are due. We love you, Lord. That's why we sing your praises. Teach us in your word. Teach us in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Howdy, church. We are going to, uh, we are continuing our series on faith. We are looking at um, the, the story of David and Goliath uh, called Five Smooth Stones is the name of the series. And it's really just a, it's an exercise or, or a um, study in faith. Last week we talked about the challenger in this battle. We talked about Goliath and the obstacles that Goliath can represent in our own life and how that causes us to wrestle with our faith. Goliath challenged the armies of Israel by creating doubt, uh, by separating us from God, uh, and then finally by striking fear in the hearts of the armies of Israel to the point that they they refused or did not want to act. So today we want to look at David's perspective versus the army of Israel's perspective. And and we want to see how, how perspective itself can alter, can change, can affect our faith. That, that's, that's our goal today. That's what we want to we wanna look at and kind of uh, see, uh, see how, this, how this plays out in our own life, okay? So the focal passage is, uh, we're in 1, 17, 1 Samuel 17, verse 12 is where we're going to start. We're going to read through 28. Let me just kind of read that, and then we'll kind of break it down uh, as, as we go. All right, so David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest of Jesse's had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of the three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the next him, Abinadab, and the third, Shema. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. You remember the day of the Goliath? Uh, the giant Goliath would come out, and every day for 40 days, it says, that he would come out and he would taunt the armies of Israel. He would do it once in the morning and once in the evening. So 40 times or 40 days, twice a day, uh, can begin to wear on some people. So Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to see your brothers. And also these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. 
As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who, come, who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered to him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. So let's we'll kind of real break this down. So just kind of getting a glimpse of David's life at this point because we want to kind of, kind of get an idea of where David's kind of been. At this point in David's life, he's already encountered quite a bit, okay? We know that he's the youngest son of Jesse, who was an Ephrathite uh, of Bethlehem. Um, Ephratha was an important matriarch in the establishment of Bethlehem. So like, he's, he's basically from his family lineage, he is a founding father of the city of Bethlehem. So, so that's kind of, when it says an Ephrathite, he lived in Bethlehem, he's from Bethlehem. But he, he's, he was, his family was very important in the establishment of, of the city of Bethlehem. So, so he's a prominent figure, or at least his family is, pro, his family is prominent. He is, David was anointed king uh, as the next king of Israel. Uh, that's in a few, ver- or a few chapters before all of this. And it was said to have happened about the age of 9 or 12 is when uh, Samuel the prophet visited the house of Jesse and told him that one of his sons would become the next king of Israel to present them to him, right? And he goes and he gets all of his sons. He presents them to Samuel. Samuel looks at him and goes, none of these. Do you have another one? He goes, well, I have a young, I have one, but he's out with the sheep, but he's the youngest, right? Because in the, in the reality is the way that the, the way that just the culture of Israel is that most of those things go to the oldest, right? The oldest is the one who's going to inherit the good things, right? If you're the oldest, especially in this culture, then those good things are going to come to you more naturally. You, you just kind of almost expect them. So I would imagine that Eliab, when, when the prophet shows up and says, present your sons to me because I'm about to anoint one of them as the next king of Israel, Eliab, who's the oldest, probably in that moment thought to himself, I'm about to become the next king of Israel. I cannot believe this. This is the best day of my life. But that didn't happen. In fact, he says, present them to me. And says that when when they went and brought David out of the field, they brought him before Jesse. And Jesse immediately saw that the spirit of God was on him. And this was the one. And it says that the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, go and anoint him. And so he did. He anoints David as the next king of Israel. Which, you know, that's the thing is the Bible doesn't really tell us how the other seven brothers um, felt by that, right? I mean, I, yeah, it's, I, I don't have a brother. I have three sisters. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of one of those things that I just imagine, uh, I just imagine that, you know, at first it probably didn't go over well. I would imagine there's also quite a bit of teasing. And then it's also kind of one of those things where David's probably even kind of looking at him going, you better be nice to me because, you know, one day, one day, I'm, I'm going to be in charge, you know? And so, so I, I don't know. You, you, brothers have a, a unique relationship in any way. But, but so this is what's going on. So this happened just kind of depending on the timeline, anywhere from the time that David was nine, as early as nine, to maybe as late as 12 years old when, when he was anointed as king of Israel. Then it says that just a, a, maybe about a year or so later, Saul was being um, um, tormented by an a evil spirit, and so in his torment, he, he went to his advisors and they told him one of the things that you should do is you should have someone come and play the harp for you. Uh, someone who's very gifted in the harp, have them come and play the harp for you and then therefore they can, they can kind of help with this evil spirit that torments you. And so he said, make it so. And so they went and scoured and one of his advisors said, look, I know Jesse. Jesse's a well-respected, his family's well-respected in Bethlehem. He has several sons and one of his sons, the youngest, David, is an excellent harp player. You should invite him. Now you have to also understand Saul has already heard at this point about David's being anointed as the next king of Israel. He, 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 he's already heard that. Now, He's not going to overthrow Saul, or at least that's, that's not what anyone has ever told Saul. That's, uh, but when Saul's time is done, his sons will not continue the lineage. David will then take over. 
So Saul is, in the back of his mind, he's resentful of David, but at the same time, he brings him in, almost kind of like this thing of keep your enemies closer type of a mentality. So he brings David in to play, play for him, and David actually becomes one of his armor bearers as well. So he actually serves in the king's service, one, as a heart player for Saul when, when this evil spirit would torment him, but also he serves as an armor bearer for Saul at, at different times as well. So, so David and Saul have this history prior to David and Goliath. I think sometimes people think of the story of David and Goliath and they think maybe this is the first time that Saul and David have ever met, and it's not. Right? So, so we know that this happens, and this was about a year later, so he was probably 10 to 13 about that time. So then um, David is then, and so now we get to our story today. David is sent to the, the battle, uh, the Israels and the Philistines, uh, the Israelites and the Philistines battling. And um, that's probably a couple years later. So he's probably anywhere from 12 years old, as early as 12, as young as 12, to maybe as old as 15. Um, he's, he's not old enough to fight. Typically, fighting age was around 18, 19, 20 uh, in, that, in that, that, that frame of reference. So he's not old enough to fight, but he is, uh, he's there and he's, he's 15 years old or, or 12 to 15 years old, just depending on the, the time frame again. And so he shows up and he's a typical, I, I, regardless, I think he's still a teenager. And he shows up and he's a typical teenage boy showing up to a fight And what does he want? He wants to see a fight, right? I mean, that's almost every teenage boy, if you give them the option, like, hey, look, you can look over here and watch these trees. Aren't they beautiful? This is a wonderful landscape. Or you could turn this way and watch these men fight each other. They're going to be like, fight, fight. You know, it's just kind of one of those things. Um, so, so he's excited for the fight. He gets there and you, you see it in the text because it says that he immediately just leaves everything with the keeper of the supplies with the supply master. He leaves everything with him and then he runs to the front lines. Like he doesn't, he runs to find his brothers. He's like, "Woo, what's going on? And he's excited. The story tells us that the men, that they got all excited, that they, they even did their battle cries that morning. Can you imagine that? 40 days. 40 days getting up, getting dressed, putting on your armor, getting ready, preparing yourself, these battle cries, and going out. And for 40 days, the giant, Goliath, coming out, taunting you, fear uh, overcoming you, and then just running back to your tent going, I don't even know what we're thinking today. For 40 days, I mean, you want to talk about mental warfare right there? I mean, that had to wear on them as well. And then also from this story, later on in the story, we're going to realize or we're going to learn that David has also been in battle to some degree, right? He's been in battle. He, he tells Saul a little, little bit later, he says, look, he says, I'm, I'm not an untested warrior. Like, for example, when the bear came after the lion or the sheep, I went and I chased the bear down and I rescued the sheep from the bear's mouth. When the lion came after the sheep, I went and chased the lion down and I rescued the lion from the sheep's, or from, I rescued the sheep from the lion's mouth. So I'm not an untested warrior. I, I've, I've, been, I've, I've been in battle. So we, we've learned all of these things about David. David's kind of had, regardless, 12 to 15 years old, he's lived quite a life, right? He's, had a, he's seen a lot of things. He, he, we, we, we see a lot about him. And through this, and a lot of this stuff that we see, he has exhibited this amazing amount of faith and trust in God throughout all of this. David has seen God's hand in his life on several different occasions. The fights with the wild beast, the anointing as the new king of Israel. Jesse, his father, is well-known. He's a respectable man. I mean, listen, the the advisors to Saul would not recommend Jesse or his family to, to the king if if Jesse wasn't a well-respected man of God, uh, uh, an honorable man. So David's coming from a really, really good, really strong family. David has remained humble. He continues to give God credit for all the victories that occur in his life. He hasn't let his victories go to his head, nor has he used them to taunt his power, his prowess, but rather... He's used it to explain and to describe and to share what God has done for him. So the armies of Israel, right? Very few men want to go into battle. 
Men have and will continue to display, in, at least in my opinion, amazing and honorable sense of pride as they, they gather up and they rise up for their country, for their loved ones, for their families to go and defend, uh, to defend something. Some, 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 someone is threatening them. And the men of Israel were no dif- different. They had gathered for battle. And while we see this story and we think of many of them as cowards because they ran away from Goliath, isn't that more of a normal response? I mean, how often do you encounter a, a, a giant who's said to, you know, the Bible tells us he's nine feet tall and he wants to just fight. I just want to fight one of you. Pick one of you. Pick, pick your best warrior, you know. I imagine at that point there's people going, you know, I'm not very good with a sword, probably not me, you know. Or, or, or hey, you know, you're really good with a spear. Like, no, I'm not that good. I get lucky a lot. I'm not good at it with a spear at all. That's not me, right? Can you imagine how that conversations would go each day as people going, hey, maybe we should have a competition to see who the greatest warrior is. And you know, like, man, you, if they did, would you imagine some of those guys, they'd be throwing competitions, like, you know, like I'm, I'm losing on purpose, taking a dive. I, I just can't imagine. But that's the thing is while, yes, there, there are men who are brave and, and I, I truly believe every morning they got up and they were serious about their willingness to defend their nation, when they saw Goliath, all of that courage, all of that bravery, all of that faith that they had went away because they saw Goliath and they saw an obstacle that was too great to overcome. They saw something that they could never defeat. And let me just ask you, have you ever encountered anything like that in your own life? An obstacle that you've looked at and said, this this is too great to overcome. Whether it's a situation in your family, whether it's a relationship, I mean, let's be, let's be honest, divorce is ugly and prevalent in many, almost every single one of us knows someone or have been directly related to divorce in some way. And so many times it starts out like, is this something I can overcome? And you see, and then all of a sudden it becomes some sort of a giant thing and we just can't overcome some of these things. There are illnesses out there that, I mean, when you hear the word cancer sometimes, the automatic response is, well, this is the end. So many people respond with that type of mentality. It's like, this is it. There are giants all over our life that we look at when we see them. We always want to think, right, that if we were in this spot, we would be more like David. But the reality is sometimes those giants are so big that it's hard for us to see anything but that giant. It's hard. We don't know any other way out. We don't know any other relief from it. And so we've already resigned the fact that our, our Goliaths are going, to, are going to win. And so what do we do? We just go out every day, put on a good face, try and stay strong for others, when in reality on the inside we are scared to death of what could happen. That's kind of how I believe the armies of Israel were. I believe that they were, they were brave in the fact that they wanted to defend their country. They wanted to fight for their families. They wanted to, to stop the oppression that the Philistines had as they lived off on the coast. And they wanted more of the land. They wanted to keep their families safe. I believe their intent was genuine. But man, every time Goliath came out, every morning, every evening, they looked out and they were like, you know, regardless of what I want, I can't beat him. I want to beat him, but I can't beat him. He's bigger than me. He's stronger than me. He's probably a better fighter than me. He's been trained his whole life for this. I tend sheep when I'm not doing this. 
I'm a blacksmith. I'm a farmer. When I'm not doing this, And they were in fear. They were in fear. I truly believe, like, I, like one of their greatest fears was like, for some reason, that someone was going to pick them. I truly, and we'll, we'll get to this because we're going to talk about Saul as, as we talk about these characters. But I truly believe, and we'll talk more about this, but I truly believe that Saul was the most fearful of all of them. Because when the Bible describes Saul, it always describes him as he was a head taller than everyone else. Like if you go and you look at all the descriptions of Saul, especially in the very beginning when we're being introduced to Saul and who he is, the Bible says that he was a head taller than other men. So you can imagine, right? As everyone's looking around going, who can we send out to fight Goliath? And Saul's like, I don't know who you guys think. You know? Because size-wise, Saul was the closest thing they had. He was a warrior. He was trained. As king, he would have been trained in in fighting. It made sense. Man, Saul was not. He was not. And Goliath would come out and taunt them for 40 days straight. And the Bible says he would go into the valley and yell at them every morning and every evening. So from this, there are three specific things. I think there are three things that we can learn about our faith that that cause us to lose our faith, that we can kind of maybe hopefully protect ourselves against. And the one, we kind of got into it last week, but number one is fear. And we we talked about fear last week, how fear can cause us to freeze and not act, but, and, and, but we didn't spend a lot of time on it. And so... That's the thing. Fear causes us not to act sometimes. When Goliath would come out and shout at the armies of Israel, each time it says they were terrified deeply and shaken. It also says that they would then run away in fright. Can you imagine just the mental anguish that that would just continue? For 40 days, they would get excited, go down to the front lines. Goliath would come out, taunt them. They would get fear, they would become fearful, and then they would run away for 40 days. I imagine every day they woke themselves, they woke up, probably even saying, you know what, today's the day. Today's the day. I bet, you know, t- I'm gonna step up. I'm gonna step up and challenge this giant. How dare he? And then he comes out. And fear just takes over. Have you ever done, have you ever done, anyone in here ever done ropes courses? Like a ropes course? Okay, a few of you. Have you ever done the high elements of a ropes course? Like where you're way up high off the air, or off the ground? Some of you have, some of you haven't. So um, I've, I've done this several times. I've taken youth and taken uh, leaders to do some of these ropes courses. One of the ones, and it's actually my favorite, but it's my favorite because it's also the most frightful for me it's a it's a thing called the pamper pole that, or at least that's what the place that I would go they'd call it there's two places I guess they call it that the pamper pole and the pamper pole is basically it's a like a telephone pole that's 30 feet high and you climb up the telephone pole it has nice handholds it's not hard to climb up it's basically like climbing up a ladder 30 feet you've got a harness you've got harness your harness here you're harnessed on your chest and you've got two ropes that are attached to both to both harnesses and then attach the ropes above you. So like, you know, you're up there. And so you get up there and you stand on the top. You, you get yourself. And one of the hardest things on the pamper pole is once you get to the top of that pole is then you stand up on top of that pole. Well, it's a telephone pole. So it's about, you know, it's about this big around. And very few people's feet are that small. So your feet are kind of hanging off the edge of this pamper pole. And you're looking down 30 feet. And from 30 feet, from 30 feet, man, that looks a long way. When you look at the bottom, when you're on the bottom of it, you look at it and you go, that's not really that tall. But then on top of it, there's a trapeze bar. And it's about eight feet away. 
And eight feet may sound like a big thing because you're like going, oh, I'm only, I'm, I'm six foot. Eight feet, you know, my arms outstretched, I could probably just like fall and grab it, right? It's not hard. And when you're looking down from the, or looking up from the ground, you look at it and you go, that's really not that far from that pole. And then you get up there, and the other thing about that pamper pole is it's actually, I'm about six foot. The pamper pole only is about five feet above the top of the pole. In other words, for me, so it's three feet down. But you get up there, and I get up there, and it is, it's scary. Like, you get there, and you're kind of, you know, and they're the first, like, usually the first time when you stand up, and almost everyone does this, like, you stand up, and, like, you can't help it. Your legs begin to shake. Almost every person who stands up there, even those who jump immediately, for, for that one instance, as you're pushing yourself up, and you're standing, your legs shake. Because that's not a normal situation you find yourself in very often, Right? You're not accustomed to that fear that, that your body is just, your body's telling you, go, looking around going, hey, this isn't a good place to be, right? Your body just kind of tells you, normal people don't go stand on the top of telephone poles. And I remember as I'm, I was up there this one time, I was up there and I'm standing and typically they want you to stand there and then they go, okay. So now you're going to count one, two, three, and then jump. So one, two, three, and you say jump, and then you jump on jump, right? One, two, three, so that the person on the ground holding your ropes knows that you're going to jump because they first want to give you a little bit of slack because the thing is, if they don't give you slack and you try and jump, you don't go anywhere, right? (laughs) Because he's holding the, 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 the ropes. And if you try and jump and you don't go anywhere, well then, but there's also that fear of like, how much slack are you going to give me? Because like, what if I miss that trapeze? Well, yeah, you're going to fall a few feet, but I'm going to catch you and then I'll lower you down. And so that's always the fear of like, what if I don't catch it? Oh, I'm, I've got the rope. You're not going to fall to the ground. But what if I do? But you won't. Has anyone ever? No, I could be the first. So that's what you're saying. I could be the first. And so all of these thoughts grow in your head. So listen, I remember this one time I had done the pamper pole and usually it's one of those things because it's one of the most fearful things. So I would try to do it first to show the youth or show whoever I was out there with, hey, this is a good thing. And I, was, I went first this one time or this several times and I would go first and I would get up there like one, two, three, jump. And most of the time I grabbed the pole. It's because the reality is you think, most of the time you think, oh, it's really far, I've got to jump. Most of the time the people that miss it because they, they jump too far and like their elbows hit the pole and they're not going, ah, and they're like now trying to dodge the pole with their head. Because it's not that, you don't have to jump that far. It's not hard to grab hold of. It looks like it is, but it's not. But you hit that or you grab that. But I remember this one time. I got up there and I'm like, whew, okay, all right, all right. And they're like going, come on, you got it, you got it. And they're, everyone's cheering me on and I'm sitting up there and I'm just like, all right, ready? One, two, three. All right, give me a second. I got it. I've done this before. One, two, three. And here's the thing that I've learned. And I've learned it not just from that day, but I've learned the longer someone sits up there and convinces themselves they can't do it, the less likely they're going to actually do it. And you know the crazy thing is, even though I've jumped before from that pole, I, I'm up there telling myself, the longer you sit here, the harder it's going to be. Just jump. Just jump. But for whatever reason, that day, that one time, I could not make myself jump. I actually climbed back down the pole. I couldn't make myself jump. I had done it several times before, but that one time I couldn't do it. So here's the thing. I think that there are many of the armies of Israel went out those days going, look, I have fought for the Lord. I have done these things. This, this, this giant that comes out, I think I could beat him. I'm smaller. I'm faster. I think, I think maybe I could, you know, I could beat him. I think many of them went out that day telling themselves, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Someone's going to step up. We're going to challenge this man. And 
And Israel's going to prevail today. And for whatever reason, the fear just took hold of them and they couldn't go anywhere. I think most of us have probably been in situations like that before. I know I have. Fear can cause us to miss out on the victories that God has planned for us. You know, I've, I told you guys before, I've taught this story so many times. and I've said it really didn't matter what weapon David took on the battlefield that day. I mean, that's kind of the thing I've said before. God was winning that battle as soon as someone stepped up and allowed their faith to believe that God would win the battle. Like I've told people, like I believe David could have walked out there with, you know, a couple spit wads and a straw. And he'd have won that battle. Because it was never about David. You know that, right? But that's the thing. Fear can cause us to miss out on the victories that God has planned for our lives. Because we just feel too afraid to act. We fall away because we believe God needs us to fight his battles. We think that's our responsibility. Many times he just needs us to show up and trust him. The second thing that causes us to lose our faith is we begin to look around and ask, you know, whose job is it? What job, whose job is this? When David's brother Eliab heard David talking, his first response was, aren't you supposed to be with the sheep? Aren't you supposed to be taking care of the sheep? This isn't your job, David. This isn't your job. To which, you know, I would love for David to look at him and go, well, it's kind of yours, isn't it? I mean, you're the one with the sword. You're the one in armor. But he doesn't. Sometimes, sometimes things happen in our church or don't happen. And they're always, they don't always get done because we don't have someone willing to just do it sometimes. Well, that's not my job. And I imagine at some point, maybe some of those men even sat there, some of those soldiers were like, you know, that's that's, one of the commanders needs to do that. One of the professional soldiers needs to do that. Saul needs to do that. It's not my job. I mean, many times... And all of us can testify to this. If you've, if, you've served, if you've served God for any length of time, you can testify to this. Many times our faith is renewed and our faith is strengthened when we do the things that God puts in front of us. Regardless, of, they don't even have to be great tasks. Just small, little tasks that God puts in front of us. Our faith is renewed many times in just those Sometimes our church, things don't get done. People, people need to be called and checked on from time to time. And it's like, well, you know, you and Scott, we, we, the thing is, is, as much as we want to and much as we try, we, we can't get to everybody. And sometimes, sometimes we don't even know about it. I'm not going to say his name, Eddie. But Eddie had a surgery, and I didn't know about his surgery until afterwards. And he wasn't mad. He wasn't. And I'm sure Eddie, he's a great guy, wonderful guy. Everybody loves Eddie. But, it's, you know, he's probably like, I don't want to bother anybody. I would have loved to have been there, but that's okay. But sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we don't know about those things. Sometimes we don't know about what's going on. People need to be visited in the hospital. People need to just be encouraged sometimes. People need to be loved. People need people in their lives to just love on them and hold them accountable. Waiting for others to step up and do a job sometimes shows a lack of faith in believing that God can use anyone to accomplish his tasks. You know who God wants to use? He wants to use the person who makes themselves available. Are you available? Are you available? And then the third thing. And I think sometimes it can be our favorite is is blame. 
Sometimes it's easier to blame others for our fear and our failures than it is to believe that God can use us to lead others to victory. Eliab said, I know about your pride and your deceit, right? That's what he told David. I know about your pride and your deceit, David, right? Brothers, right? I mean, come on. Rather than Eliab actually owning his own faith or lack of faith, sometimes it's much easier, much better for us to point out others' faults, others' failures, and others' own lack of faith rather than coming alongside them, encouraging them, cheering for them, loving on them. So what is this? It's about perspective, right? What's the difference between the armies of Israel, lack of faith, and David's act of faith was perspective. See, the armies of Israel saw Goliath as an unbeatable foe. David saw him as a foe challenging an unbeatable God. The armies of Israel saw Goliath as someone stronger than them. David saw Goliath as someone much, much weaker than his God. The armies of Israel saw Goliath as someone who might be able to beat all of them. Like if he were to fight the entire ranks of Israel, he would beat them. David saw Goliath and the entire Philistine army as someone who could not even come close to comparing to the power of his God. But see, it's not just simple perspective. It's actually your perspective of who God is. Changing our perspective doesn't always change things. Sometimes it just changes our view. Changing our our perspective on God Changing our perspective on God, that can change the world. That was the perspective that David took, not only to this battle, but to much of his life. And the world around David was impacted by that. His faith was shown because of that. Hebrews 11 talks about him and says, he was a man after God's own heart. Because he was a great warrior? No. Because of his faith. Because of his faith. Because, he was a, because of his faith, because of his belief that God had called him to fight whatever battle or just, just to be his representative in the battle. God was going to take care of the battle. I don't, I don't mean to give a spoiler alert, but you, you remember what David says to Goliath. You come at me with sword and spear, but I come at you in the name of our God, and he will hand you over to us today. David knew it wasn't about the weapons. He knew it wasn't about the training. He knew it wasn't about strength. He knew it wasn't about just intimidation. He knew it's always about God and who is God. And as we face those Goliaths in our life, how do you see God in that? And that's the thing. Is God one of the, is he a character, right, that that pops up occasionally in our life, in our thought process? Or is he the first person, the first thought that comes up for us on a daily basis. What's your perspective of God? How do you see him? Not just changing our perspective, but changing our perspective on God. That yes, every single person in this room has the potential to change the world. If you just have the right perspective on who he is. Father, this morning we come. Father, we are, Lord, when it comes to all of the evils and trials and stuff in this world, Lord, we don't compare. 
We aren't strong enough. We aren't good enough. We aren't fast enough. We aren't big enough to overcome. any of the obstacles that, we're, that we face. Sometimes we get lucky and Father, we think that it's us. We think that we did something. But God, the reality is that every trial, every tribulation, every struggle, every obstacle, every Goliath that comes up is an opportunity for our faith to grow. It's an opportunity for us to exercise our trust, our belief in you. It's an opportunity to give in to you. It's an opportunity for us to change our perspective on who you are. How do you see God? Lord, I pray that each and every person in this room might ask themselves their perspective of who you are in their life. That they're not, that you're not just a a small role or small character, but Father, that you might be the main character of their life. Knowing that nothing is impossible with you. Knowing that we are more than conquerors with you. Knowing that there is no Goliath in the world that could stand against you. Father, help us. Help us change our perspective on the things that need to be changed. Whether it's our families, our relationships, our finances, our faith, our ego, our pride. Lord, help us have the proper perspective. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm just simply going to invite you to respond. As the praise team sings, you just respond in whatever way God has put in your heart. You respond.
vamos a No Bible study this evening, all right? Um, and then this week is kind of a normal uh, Wednesday week uh, this week. So May 20, well, I'm, 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 Mary Lou, I got this all messed up. I was looking at it. April 27th, the ladies are having um, kind of a Mother's Day celebration, and that's going to be at Northside Baptist Church in Huntsville. Is that correct, Mary Lou? Okay, so if you're interested in doing that, get with Mary Lou and she, or Miss Michelle, and she can help you with that. Um, on April 28th, we are having our special called business meeting that we discussed at the town hall. So be sure to be in attendance on that to discuss a potential merger with declaration. I don't have anything else, but we were going to have Josh and the praise team. They're going to lead us in one last song, and then we'll be dismissed. The next few weeks, we're just going to close with the doxology. Let's sing this together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heaven. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen, church. Have a blessed week. You are scattered.